really triggered you to move from this uh, activism kind of to building house into community building house? That's the transition. Now the main thing was the main thing was this realization, you know, that we are talking and fighting for uh, housing rights and so on without having a clue or without any reflection of what housing really means. And predictably, the kind of campaigns for housing rights, the kind of campaigns for the rights of construction workers, for instance, have predictably gone that way. I will give you two examples. Uh, one is you know, what has become of housing rights. For me, it was a you know a big eye opener that uh, I'll tell you a story. We started this campaign for housing rights. We uh, mobilized people to demand for housing rights and so on. In various, in a general theme, it was to make housing as a fundamental right in the constitution. And the more specific things was according to local needs and local uh, you know uh, uh, local needs specifically. Uh, so at that time there was a parliamentary committee set up on housing rights. So a number of parliamentarians, MPs came who were supposed to go to all parts of India and listen to uh, people's woes on what were the problems of existing housing policy and what should be the new housing policy and so on and so forth. So they came here to Bangalore and we were part of the national housing rights campaign and we were going to present a few case studies of what is wrong with the current housing rights policy and how people are being deprived of uh, basic access to housing resources and so on. The problem is that this, this whole parliamentary committee uh, hearings took place in Ashoka Hotel first and second and this for me was an eye opener. The whole thing, the problem is not that it took place in Ashoka Hotel. The IOPR was that it was completely sponsored by Kendra Bank Housing Finance Division, Can Bank Housing. So this was the time in the late 1980s when I think there were people who were much smarter than all of us in NCHR and so on put together, which is the lobby of bankers and construction, uh, you know, uh, construction companies who had already seen that there was a growing demand for middle class housing, for housing finance. So housing rights became very truncated and translated into housing finance. Now one can argue about it and say that uh, uh, that's a wrong thing and so on. But whether it is right or wrong, that is the real thing. That is what really happened. So a campaign for housing rights, one way or the other, gets translated to a demand for money to build more houses. You know, that's the bottom line, that's the reality. I mean, one can analyze it and one can uh, you know, uh, break down the economic theories to say that why this is happening and so on. But bottom line is, this is what happened. And for me, that was an eye-opener. It was completely an eye-opener. We never, never thought that this is what is going to happen or this is what was in the cards. That was one. Second thing is if you take during the same time there was also another big campaign for the rights of construction workers. Now what has happened to that campaign? There was some efforts to start a cooperative of construction workers to take up projects uh, which a construction workers cooperative can take and build and so on. Some of it I think has been implemented, you know, done in Delhi. I am not sure of what their actual existing practices are. But the point remains that finally when a kind of a policy or a bill was produced by this campaign for construction workers, it was nothing else but a major, it was a nothing else but a proposal for a major effort to uh, track and coordinate movement of people from village to cities. So construction workers campaign finally meant that at every village level there will be a uh, like an employment agency registration booth. So you go there and you put your name and you say I am unemployed, I want to be construction worker. 
then that data will be sent to some uh, registry in uh, Bangalore, say. And in Bangalore, when you go there, you're supposed to go there and register and say, I have come from this such and such village, so give me a job from here. It was such a naive conception of what the state and political culture here is. It was absolutely naive. On the one hand. On the other hand, it was not so naive because it also spoke in terms of a language which policy planners will very much appreciate. Like, like you know, uh, the idea of administering a people or administering a population, the idea of administering a, uh, a, group, a, a country, for example, is only by having extension counters everywhere. You know, extension counter in this village, extension counter in that village, extension counter here. So it is that extension counter culture of uh, tracking, of surveilling, you know, people's movement everywhere. So that is what this whole construction workers bill has finally come down to. The problem in my opinion, we can talk about this in more detail later, has to do with the conception of labor. What is the idea of labor? How can something when, you know, uh, somebody does some work around their house or somebody cleans a field or what that woman is doing there is considered labor, how that labor can be measured, can be monetized, can I put a value to and how it can be added into a larger economic theory. That is the effort and neither the campaign for housing rights nor the campaign for construction workers in my opinion have sufficiently challenged these, these base concepts of labor and in fact forget challenge, they are operating from there. You remove the idea of labor from their discourse, then it's like their legs are cut off, they're dead, they can't do anything else after that.